So hi, hi everyone. Good, I say good morning, but it's good afternoon. Just, just pip the pip the morning post. Um, but guys, today we've got we're joined by um, three industry colleagues from Unique Venues of London. Uh, UVL is the not-for-profit marketing arm of some of the greatest and finest venues London has to offer. Um, I have to say that as being one of the founding members many, many years ago when I was running Spencer House. Um, who is still, but Lisa, Lisa Hatswell now runs the, the, the marketing and everything else and the, the, the process for these guys, but also we're joined by Natasha for, from the Royal College of Physicians and Liz from the historic Royal Palaces. Um, and it's, it's really about sort of talking to you guys about how you cope with the COVID and also what you've been doing and how you're getting ready for how you see events returning to live you know, I know some of you have got lots of meeting facilities, some haven't, some have invested in meeting facilities to be able to host hybrid events. Um, of course, lots of you do sponsor and exhibition activities, which many of our members I know support. I think I caught a little bit there from Lauren earlier. Um, but yeah, you know, tell us what's going on within UVL, because I think you're, you're a great association, a great network and some absolute stunning, stunning venues. Uh, Lisa, I don't know who's starting, you, you kick yeah. off. Yeah. It's, my, it's myself starting. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's lovely to see you all. And uh, yes, Richard has been involved with Unique Venues of London for quite a lot of time over the years. And uh, um, and myself, I'm Lisa Haxwell from Unique Venues of London. And uh, actually, Unique Venues of London has been going for 28 years now. So quite a long time. Um, it started in 1993. And myself, I've actually been involved for 20 years. So it's, it's been a long time. I was voluntary to begin with um, and was chairman for a very long time. And then in 2011, I took a managerial role, which helps the organization more in terms of their inquiry service and their marketing, et cetera. So Ria, would it be okay to start the slides? And Lisa, how many venues are involved now? Because when, when we it was have about, just we had over 12 eight. people started, I think. You did indeed. It was low numbers to begin with, but we have just over 80 now. Wow. So uh, so a fair, a fair number um, and uh, very different in what they all do. But uh, I'll give you just a quick snapshot, give everybody an idea of who we have included. So Priya, if we move on to the next slide and the one after that. So there we go. So you'll recognize some of these. I'm sure you would have hosted some events in them in the past or have visited them as a tourist, but things like Hampton Court Palace, Westminster Abbey, Tower Bridge, some very iconic and famous landmarks in London. We also have, moving on to the next slide, lots of museums and galleries. So things like the v &A, the National Gallery, the National History Museums, um, lots and lots of different ones, large and small. So the next one, moving on, you'll see some more perhaps unknown ones, ones that perhaps we classify as hidden gems. So you've got things like Two Temple Place, the Family Museum, RSA House. So all, as you can see, extremely different. Oh, we're going a bit fast there. <laughs> but uh, all, all um, able to host events, whether large or small, we're able to do events for two or very large numbers when we're able to. Because we're an association where our venues are all, their primary business is something else. So as we've seen, their museums, galleries, tourist attractions, et cetera, we do also run a very strict criteria process. So we do ask any new members that come to us wishing to be, have membership, that they go through a process that demonstrates that they are unique, so that their business is something other than events, that they have neutrality in terms of that it's the venue joining and the venue is aware that they are joining, it's not just a representative, that they demonstrate excellence in every single way. So we make sure that all their paperwork is up to date, that their liability is in place, that their compliance is extremely good. We also have our own articles of association and codes of practice which we ask them to follow. In terms of the process, it can take a new member between three and six months to become a member. We go through an interview process, a fully informed process, and also have to present to the current membership where the membership actually votes to make sure that they're happy for them to come within the organisation as the organisation is actually owned by the members themselves. We're non-for-profit making, very much probably like the EMA is, and in terms all of the venues are actually members. So Priya, if we can move on to the next slide. 
As we um, have all been experiencing, we really have been having a very challenging and difficult time over the last year. And we've been going through lots of guidelines and processes and procedures, because obviously um, they have been coming out through the government guidelines. But also we've been making sure that the venues are aware that actually their health and safety at work track is just as important. And it's the case of making sure their event space is a safe place for their employees and for also their customers. But the guidelines and roadmap are out. They are forever changing, which I'm sure you're all feeling the same, but we constantly give updates. And if we move on to the next slide, Priya, um, we, like yourselves, are very much involved with the BBEP, which is the Business Visits and Events Partnership. And we've been making sure that we've been getting across our venues, current views and challenges, and putting a case a point so that they're able to discuss that with the DCMS when they're talking about guidelines, etc., And hence, we're able to feed that information back into the venues and working with the other associations within BBP, like the AMA, it gives a good all-rounded help for us in terms of the whole industry. But very early on last year, and it does feel like quite a while ago now, we got together a number of our venues and suppliers, and we started what was the workshop to put together our UVL COVID-19 framework for events. Now, this is something we wanted to put together to actually help the venues and suppliers in their own policies and procedures, giving them guidance of what to consider and how to use it. So each venue itself has its own policy and procedures, but they've used this framework to build those assets. So Priya, if we move on. So the framework is split into seven main areas. So it's things like contracts and main general um, venue considerations. The inquiry stage of the process, site visits, the event itself, staff, suppliers, and also post event, which is just as important. Now, the framework is quite large. Um, there's a little glimpse of it there, and there's lots of information um, under each stage. But to give you an idea, when it comes to contracts and um, general venue guidance, it's making sure that the venues have in place their correct public liability insurance and it's all validated that their terms and conditions are all up to date and they reflect the current situation and perhaps any future potential pandemics in the future and that they check their cancellation policies and reflect any changes that might take place. Also to look at their specific risk assessments and also things like their fire and major emergency procedures. As certain procedures that were in place in the past might now be different because they've got things such as social distancing to take into account. So it's those sorts of things and also recommending that perhaps the venues might like to consider applying for recognised UK schemes so that their clients feel confident and happy that they're following the procedures themselves. So things like Visit Britain's We're Good To Go and the AIM Secure Accreditation. So they themselves have lots of process and information within them and the venues are also following those guidance. So with our framework, with all of those guidance and their own policies, lots of information is covered. So for example, in the inquiry stage, we're asking them to make sure they communicate all their guidance, all their social distancing plans and procedures, their revised capacities and floor plans, and also discussing that actually plans may change. There may be a need for contingency plans and just having those discussions in the first place. And also, of course, discussing hybrid events. It's an element that every inquiry is likely to request. So it's very important that they start that at the inquiry stage. Then when it comes to site visits, making sure that if they come in person, if it's necessary, or giving them the option if they like to have an online site visit, which many of the venues are absolutely capable to do now and have been doing almost a year of them. Um, also, if they do come on site, just explaining what they're going to expect and what an event, how that would take place, and what their clients would like, would see. Making sure they're aware where they can sanitize and wash their hands, et cetera, where they need to follow one-way systems and anything else that they might need to know. When it comes to the events, it will be things like explaining there might be need for staggered arrival times, that there'll be lots of signage around the venues, that there'll be signage about making sure that people have their face masks, where to have sanitizing, to keep, keep social distancing, et cetera, that there may be temperature checks on arrival and that the attendance records will be recorded and kept for 21 days. 
also, of course, making sure that there's checking procedures throughout the day at the venue and the event itself, and making sure that all social distancing is maintained. But also making sure things like flip charts, pens, papers, things that you would normally touch, use and pass on, coffee machines, water bottles, avoiding those and making sure that clients have their own facilities that they need. Food and beverage guidelines do keep changing as we go through the step process and the venues will be able to guide you as to what you can and can't do in each step. Also making sure that clients are aware that they have isolation facilities and any other aspects. So there's lots of detail um, in which we recommend that the venues follow. There's also when it comes to staff and suppliers, making sure that they have comprehensive training plans, that they have all the PPE in place, that they have health and safety and monitoring and recording procedures as well, and that they ask, like they always do with their suppliers, that their public liability documents are in place, their rounds, their COVID risk assessments are all there and ready and discussed prior to the event itself. Not forgetting post-event, it's just as important. So obviously a thorough clean of the event space after it's been used, and also asking the client, how was the event? How did they find the procedures? If there was any recommendations for changes, it's important that we all do that as we're still learning as we go in these very challenging times. Also making sure they manage the track and trace post-event and having clear guidelines how to report any illnesses. So there's lots and lots of detail that this framework has given them. And from this, the, the venues themselves have built their own policies and procedures. Many of them are available on our website. Each of the venues have their own venue page. And there's a little button where you can click on and see their COVID policies and also the revised capacities. If it's not there, there's a message that you can contact the venue directly because they may be updating or just constantly changing them. So they've decided to keep them in house. Mm -hmm. But moving on, if there's any questions at all around the COVID um, guidelines at all, anything on the floor? Yeah, Lisa, I, I just dropped a note down. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things here, discussions that we're having about, you know, live events going back to live and when companies are going back to live, I, I think to share with my thinking, there's, 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 there's a great opportunity here. I want you supporting the arts and culture predominantly mm -hmm. across, across London. By, by looking at these venues. However, these venues also give a big draw to attendees to say, well, I will attend the event live um, and you know, not just listen in because this venue is of great interest. There's art, there's culture, there's, I can go on a tour, I can visit things, there's something to discuss. So, so I think there's quite a nice way of mixing that up. Yeah. Um, but the other question that I have is that in contracting, so you guys have gone through all your health and safety procedures and COVID procedures. If we're contracting now with, with, with a venue, does that cover all the suppliers? Or so basically, who, where does the liability stop? Or do we have then separate contracts with your caterers, with your florist? Or you know, is that now all wrapped under the one venue contract? It, it, this could probably answer this probably a lot quicker than I could because I can see you're trying to answer it as I speak. But uh, Liz, do you want to, to want to say something? Yes, I just want to jump in. Sorry, Lisa. Um, okay. Yes, we, we actually use a, approved suppliers for all of our events. We don't have any in-house um, supplying suppliers at all. Um, and so essentially what we have done as part of that COVID preparation from our side, we have been in contact with each one of our suppliers and have rolled out this framework to them as well. So uh, going through, when we, when, we have, when we create our approved supply list, they have to um, supply us with certain information, of course, which includes risk assessments, their insurance um, and uh, their operating procedures and how they're going to operate in our venues. And so ultimately, we have just kind of gone through that again and refreshed everything to be have a COVID layer over it. Yeah. So all of those suppliers have written their own um, COVID risk assessments, COVID operating procedures for working in our venues. And then we have obviously just checked that we're happy with them and it, and it fits within this framework. And then so ultimately we've done the work for you. But when you when you would um, contract with the supplier, they would provide you with that anyway. So you could so you could ask them for it. But we as the venue have ensured that all of the suppliers that we work with fit into this same framework. Yeah. OK, cool. Thanks. 
And I think other, other elements I'll probably touch on. So I will talk about how you can use the wonderful backdrops and all the other interaction things within hybrid events, absolutely. So I'll give you some examples of that um, as we go through this next section. So hybrid events is something that we all seem to know a lot about now, which perhaps if you'd asked us a year ago, we didn't. Um, it's become very widely accepted, like we're doing today, that you can do things virtually, and, but you, in the future, we'll also be able to do a combined mixture of live and, and obviously online. It's obviously um, getting very used to doing it domestically, but internationally, it might be very important because those um, delegates may not be able to come to your event, for example. Hybrid events, however, isn't a new term, and we've probably all been doing it for years. You know, we've all been recording an event or taking part in part of a video conferencing. So it's not new, but I think it's a case of not being scared of the word, but just realizing that there's lots more opportunities to use now moving forward. There are advances in technology, but the main equipment and services have been around for a very long time. So all of the in-house specialist production teams, all of the third party specialists are very adapt to using all of this equipment and will be able to guide you all the way. So Priya, can we just move on to the next slide? So many of our venues have been adapting and creating new spaces, as you touched on, Richard, and they really range from full broadcasting facilities. So top right, you can see the Twickenham studio at Twickenham Stadium, which is absolutely all singing or dancing because they are absolutely used to doing broadcasting. Their sports require them to have the most amazing technology. So, you know, you can have absolutely things like that. And then you can have live streaming, galleries are changing. So down below, you'll see the National Gallery. They've changed one of their areas, which was a restaurant into a more hybrid meeting room. And they're working with third parties to be able to produce that. We also have the ability to use smart stages. So there's lots of variation. So Priya, moving on to the next slide. But then it can be as simple as using meeting rooms and adapting them, theatres. But they all have inspiring backdrops. As you can see here, we've got 10 to 11 Carlton House Terrace. And we've got the lovely RSA House Theatre, which is down below the vaults, which is that lovely brick surface above. So there's lots of different aspects for you to choose. So Priya, moving on. But to make it a little bit easier and to help you in the whole process of where you start, we do actually have a new section on our website called Hybrid Events. So this section will just give you a brief outline what I've just explained. But also, if we move on to the next slide, it has a PDF on that area that lists all the venues that can do hybrid events, what they can do, how they're provided, and any other further information. So it's just a snapshot of that information. It's updated constantly as the venues are evolving all the time. But you can obviously see that yourselves, but you can also contact myself and my colleague Nicola, and we can guide you through it and also then put you in touch with the venues directly and their specialists. So Absolutely. before we move on, we hope it's helpful yeah, um, and it will evolve as time goes on. Um, you know, we'll be adding to it all the time. So, uh, so do please download it, use it as much as you can, but use us as well to ask any questions. Before we move on a bit further, we're just actually going to ask yourselves some questions, if that's okay. So Priya, could we go to the poll if possible? Richard, I think you joined in as EMA and you have to launch it. It's taken it away from me. Sorry, Priya, I see you as host and me as co-host. If we're stuck, we can move on and try a bit later. It's no problem. Yeah, let's try a bit later, please. Okay, no problem. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa, I've got a quick question for okay. you. It might just help with that. Um, licensing rights, just a thought, because yes. what we have seen now from a number of speakers, because when we're now talking about doing hybrid events, we're also talking about not just live no, presentations exactly. and stuff like that. And some speakers trying to charge more that if you're going to use my my presentation or my image for three months or even a year yeah. or infinite, you need to pay me more. Yes, yeah, um, it is. And I'm wondering is. whether venues are saying, because we've recorded your, the venue, we've used your venue, we might be using 
the, the, you know, the name of the venue or photos from the venue? Is there any licensing laws or anything like it that? Is something we do, it is something you do need to ask at the inquiry stage, absolutely, because there's certain aspects, and the venues will be able to guide you at this, there's certain aspects of backgrounds that they can't use, for example. Um, so they will guide you, you know, obviously for certain paintings, certain artifacts that just aren't able to be used. Um, so it is something you do need to ask at the inquiry stage. So it is something we're all learning um, because it's being used more yeah, often. The, but, the odd Red Brandt or Reynolds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, and, and it's the same with the guided tours. And I'll touch on this, but, you know, some of the galleries and museums have partnerships and sponsors <coughs> and they're only able to do certain things for those clients. But there is a lot more that they can do for other people as well. So, so we'll definitely touch on that, too. But oh. Priya, could we bring back the presentation if possible? Okay, and on to the next slide. Okay, so to make it a bit easier, we've also put together some top tips for yourselves because it's not it's not easy to know where to start. So the first thing is making sure that you work out exactly what you want to say. It's almost like writing a story. So is it how much live element do you need? How much virtual do you need? As it will really vary what you use in terms of your equipment. Is it, for example, a one-way broadcast? So that is just a camera, like we're doing now. Or is it you require more collaboration, a two-way collaboration, for example? Do you want to go around the room? Do you want different people to speak? Because all of that will very much vary how you actually do the event. Connectivity is very important. So how do you want to deliver it? Do you have your own platform? Is it a third-party platform? Do you need, for example, chat functions, networking opportunities? Are you having a virtual exhibition? So it's all of those things you need to consider at the starting point, just to make sure that you're having that conversation with the venue and their specialist technician. What content delivery network might you use for output? So, you know, will you be using things like YouTube, Facebook? You need to consider things like music. You can't necessarily use music on those outputs because therefore licensing comes into fruition, et cetera. Do you need a protected security password portal? Our venues are all very used to working with high security. So if it's something you need, ask those questions because they very much will be able to assist you. So moving on, Priya. Also, the best advice is get your IT department to speak to the venues in-house specialists or third party specialists as soon as you can. They're the ones that are gonna be able to bottom out all of the questions that you have. But make sure that you ask What's the mechanism for test and rehearse for the event? It's very unknown for all of us, all of this technology. So it's very much, we want to try it all out before the actual day, so making sure. So it might be on the day, it might be before, but just ask them what the mechanism is. Now, Richard touched on it, but we absolutely can create unique experiences. So this could, for example, be a special tour, celebrity interviews, behind the scenes scene talks, the Design Museum, for example, you know, they can have guys that talk you through elements of the gallery. They can have inter uh, action masterclasses, online workshops. They can even get some of their accredited suppliers to do hampers back at the offices at home. A lot of our venues can do these sorts of things. So there really is all sorts of things that can take place. Twickenham can do pitch side interviews. You know, there's all sorts of interaction, bits of the museums that you can see, curators that you can speak to. So ask what they can do. There's a mass variety. They've been doing so much in the last year, over the last 12 months, that's for consumers, that can be very easily used in corporate events as well. So do ask those questions and they'll be very happy to help you. Lisa, just to jump in there, a couple of years ago, or if I say a couple, it's probably four years ago now, we did an EMA event at BAFTA on Piccadilly. Uh -huh. And they, you know, we created a wonderful event with about 60 members there. But the, the, the lady that, that we had a presentation by BAFTA, but we also then had the, I can't remember her name now, but she's the clothes designer for a number of the James Bond films. All right. And talked mm -hmm. about the whole process of the experience and the film. And, the, and it was, you know, it was, again, it was a wonderful ex insight yeah. and experience. She'd won two, two um, Academy Awards and stuff like that. And again, you don't realise these people get this behind the scenes, but it was quite staggering. Yeah. I think James Bond, uh, Tom, what's his name? Tom, um, big clothes designer. But anyway, James Bond had 21 dinner suits for the film because 
yeah. everyone had to be not that you realize yeah because <laughs> they're, they're all stressed to a different level for all the fights that he was in and everything so yeah anyway absolutely the, the the venues have a whole library of things that they can help you with so it really is asking those questions and bringing the bringing the space to life so if not everybody's able to join you on site they can still feel that they're there and also when you do have a mixture of live and virtual you've got to consider what are those people that are switching in online what are they doing in the break times can they be watching something you know could they be watching for example an astronomer's piece from the royal museum's greenwich that you know it's really interesting and in depth but kind of bringing the whole event to life so there's lots of scope for that absolutely so moving yes, on to the next slide um okay. we will be having expert talks with my colleagues so natasha and liz will be uh, joining us to talk about both of their different aspects so they'll be coming up in a few moments but moving on to the next one then you Please also asked that. us about sustainability we know that this is something that a lot of you are asking about at the moment and it's something that the venues have been working on for quite some time they all have in-depth sustainability policies particularly because their primary businesses it's very important for their primary businesses and of course events is part of that whole process so this will just give you a snapshot of you know, the sorts of things that are available but um, in terms of uh, their sourcing and implementing energy saving solutions so for example they're collecting food waste and uh, you're using that for digestion and putting that through to um, renewable energy and to fertilizer they're having lights off policies using pri sensors they're reusing water, collection and reuse of it. And they've also got low energy batteries, et cetera. So lots of different elements that they're collectively is all adding up to help hopefully your own sustainability policies as well. They also are repurposing materials. So for example, the image we see here, the Design Museum, that they repurposed a lot of the Commonwealth Institute, the building that was there in the first place before the museum itself took over. They continue to do that in the whole of the process that they do currently, working with suppliers to do that as well. So but also a lot of our venues are working with ethical and sustainable environmentally friendly working processes. So they're avoiding things like single use plastics. Um, they're asking for obviously fair trade products, local source products, um, all sorts of things. So for example, um, reusing things as food wasted I mentioned obviously in terms of turning it into energy but also they're starting to use if we move on to the next slide Priya then they're starting to use apps so even technology is getting into sustainability in this way so Tate for example they're using an app called Karma Food which is an app that uses leftover food and it goes to good causes so there's all sorts of little elements that are taking place um, Twickenham are using their eco cups. I don't know if any of you have been to the, the games at all where you get a plastic cup. They've actually saved each year 2.28 million plastic cups. So that's how many they've saved in one year. So if you think about as the years goes on, lots and lots being used. You can use those cups for events. You know, you can make it a, a part of the story. So there's lots going on. A lot of the venues are offsetting their carbon footprint and making sure there's zero to landfill being created, how they're getting rid of their waste. So there's absolutely all sorts of things taking place. So ask them about their sustainability policy. We actually will be having a whole article about it in our next newsletter next in May. So, you know, sign up to it. All of our newsletters are all um, factual. There's lots of information about what happens at the venues and will help you in that whole process of where you want to choose as well. So I hope that gives you kind of an update of the sorts of things that they're doing but it's very much on their top of their radar along with everything else so so you do ask and and they'll be very happy to help you lisa can i ask a question yes i'm not sure if course. you can hear me now sorry yes. i was Hi, trying to ask it before and then that okay, um, don't worry. demonstrated my microphone wasn't working um with virtual events do you feel that there's a lot of things that the venues and, and perhaps some of them and um, can talk about it but that you can offer virtually that wouldn't be an option in person potentially because they're too risky to have people you know in a space with certain pieces of art etc are there things that might now be available virtually there could, there, there could be at the moment obviously they're still working through what can and can't be used and what 
waiting to reopen. But it's definitely asking that question and what can be different? Some of the venues are open to having bespoke filming. So that's the sort of thing that you could do in that element. So where it's just that piece just for you. So that obviously would, would require obviously production in terms of doing the filming, but it's certainly something that can very much be asked and hopefully fulfilled very much in the future. Okay, any other questions before I move on to introduce Natasha and Liz? No, okay, so Priya, could we move on to Natasha's slides? Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me and having me along. Um, as you can imagine, this past year has had everyone thinking outside the box as to how they can continue reacting um, and reaching audiences in an impactful way. Um, and at the RCP, we were quite lucky. Um, we were in quite a unique position to lead the charge from within, um, as we already had um, established in-house virtual services through a streaming solution, which we'd been offering to our clients for quite some time. Um, and we have also a very experienced media and production services team who literally from one week to the next became, um, they definitely were, were shoved into the spotlight and we became very busy overnight. Um, what became very clear from early on um, in the journey into virtual was that clients wanted the flexibility of being able to oversee their events in person where possible. And so as those guidelines have been flexing and changing, we have had um, some key organizers and wishing to um, or preferring to, to be on site to oversee that virtual element um, of their event. Um, and as a venue, um, being the Royal College of Physicians, we have been able to host critical meetings on site throughout the pandemic. So we, we do have experience of hosting some smaller hybrid events for a selection of clients who obviously met that criteria um, for in-person critical meetings. So I'm going to walk you through um, the measures that we've put in place and some of the solutions we have available um, and just how we've worked with clients, what they've been asking for and, and how we've sort of uh, pivoted, adapted and enhanced uh, to meet those requirements. Um, next slide, please, Priya. Right, so events reimagined um, and our um, solutions really. So, sorry, excuse me. Next slide, please, Priya. <laughs> um, so our clients are becoming increasingly knowledgeable, having um, been through this for the last year and having hosted virtual events for some time, they know what they want. So with the easing of restrictions and um, the attention moving towards a hybrid solution, um, we've summed up the brief in a nutshell. Um, we feel collaborating to design, plan and produce events that deliver high quality, interactive and engaging content for both online and offline audiences and leaving delegates um, inspired and energized is what people really want. So we've put our heads together and along with um, our experiences from events we've hosted to date, we've innovated to come up with a toolbox of solutions and services um, to meet the new expectations which are posed by um, the virtual and hybrid event requirements. So these include things like um, pivoting to design our own virtual event platform. We had a range of sort of standalone services and we still do, um, but the feedback was that people wanted a one-stop um, area to uh, from which to host their events. So we have our own uh, platform called RCP Virtual. It's a, um, a white label solution for clients who also want to fully brand and customize their events. So that gives you that option. Um, it's uh, some of the other important considerations from clients um, which have come up is secure sign-in and encryption and fully GDPR compliance, which, which we have with this platform, analytics to monitor engagement and reach, and as well as safety mechanisms in place for technical failure, which we've got. Um, we've hosted 58 events on this platform to date, and so we do continue to innovate and enhance as we are getting the feedback. We also have a, a menu of bolt-on services, which allow flexibility and interactivity, um, which is a key consideration. Um, the enhancements include things such as Q&A, um, virtual exhibition halls, social networking, as well as breakout rooms. And these are all services that can be adapted to work for both virtual and hybrid. We also have created a standalone studio production service. 
Um, and a lot of people like to incorporate this element into a kind of Good Morning Britain style presenter led approach um, within the platform. And that's been quite a popular choice. So we recently hosted um, BBC Question Time and they chose this presentation style format um, they had an on-site audience of 30 um, in our library that picture to the left uh, shows shows you that um, what can we do to keep everyone engaged during breaks that comes up a lot so we've created an immersive experience for online audiences which include a pick and mix of guided pre-recorded tours by our heritage team and our museum colleagues as well as medicinal garden tours and guess the object quizzes and these options are also available for delegates attending on site. So it can happen virtually and, and physically um, within the same event. There's also a range of speaker management support options. Lisa, Lisa touched on that earlier. That's becoming really important. Um, people have very different levels of experience um, with virtual. So these include, include things like pre recording content, um, on site rehearsals. We've developed a whole range of how-to slides to show people different ways of, of recording uh, content. And then of course, post-production is also important. Extending the lifespan of the event with flexible post-event and on-demand hosting has become a very relevant part of most events now. Um, it enables increased engagement, a wider reach and improved analytics. So many clients are opting to make their events shorter over a longer period of time and they want the content available post events to keep the focus and engagement with, with the topic and event. Um, that is just a, a little snapshot for you. Um, if you can move on to the next uh, slide, uh, please, Priya. So in terms of um, safe and secure, um, what are we doing? So following the government roadmap and the framework for safe and secure hosting of events, and also um, looking at the UVL uh, guidelines that were put in place by all the venues, we revised our capacities and we've created um, opening guidelines to build confidence in return to in-person meetings. We're also a COVID secure venue for meetings, having attained our MIA COVID secure and our good to go accreditations. So the guidelines outside, um, outline what to expect before and during your time with us. And most other venues have adopted a very similar approach to ours um, and include the customer journey. Um, so for instance, before you arrive, um, we have a medical disclaimer in place, which organizes center delegates in advance. When you get to the venue, we have temperature checks and, and um, sign-in process for NHS track and trace. On site, uh, we've got one-way systems in place, sneeze screens. We ask delegates to maintain physical distancing and wear face masks. There is a process for what to do if you feel unwell. And importantly, how food and beverage will be served, which is predominantly pre-packaged non-touch options um, for, for delegates to read about how that will work. We have a description of enhanced cleaning regimes, also for peace of mind. Um, and as they say, knowledge is power. So providing this information in advance helps to make everyone feel safe and secure. Uh, next slide, please, Priya. So what are we doing um, in terms of sustainability and reducing our carbon footprint? Um, RCP London, we're continuously striving to minimize our impact on the environment and coming up with innovative ways of doing so. Sustainability is a key part of our everyday operation across all areas of our business, including catering, waste management, and energy. And our strategic objectives have been to look at all areas of our business to ensure that our suppliers and service partners are environmentally conscious and committed to helping us improve our waste streams. So we are ISO 14001 accredited. It's the environmental, environmental certification for my environmental best practice. We hold the IAC um, gold standard um, green star accreditation. So it's the International Association of Conference Centers. That association's code of sustainability includes 60 tenants in areas including waste management, recycling, and water conservation. And the RCP are the only and first uh, Royal College to achieve the carbon trust standard, um, having reduced our footprint by our carbon footprint by 30%. So the Carbon Trust Standard is the world's leading independent certification of an organization's achievements in reducing environmental impacts. So we're quite proud of that. Um, next slide, please, Priya. And just some of the initiatives which we have, we've got a whole page on our website um, with our um, 
uh, our initiatives, but just some of them are things like recy recycling our spent coffee grounds from the venue to transform three and a half thousand kilograms of waste coffee grounds into sustainable bioproducts and eco-friendly fire logs, which we actually use in our pizza ovens for summer. We work with First Mile Recycling to facilitate a range of uh, solutions and a robust waste management program. And that uh, works to significantly reduce plastic waste and increase um, recycling, working with energy efficient technology. And we've switched our electricity provision to 100% renewable energy. We use eight wormeries to recycle kitchen and garden waste and the resulting uh, compost and liquid feed is then fed to the plants in our medicinal garden. We use local and seasonal produce to support British businesses, reducing haulage costs and the environmental impact of transport. Our meat, and, our meat and dairy products are high of welfare and we serve sustainably caught fish to ensure the future of fish stocks and marine environments. We put sustainable food at the heart of our menus and have increased the proportion of vegetable led dishes on our menus to combat um, environmental damage. And that also involves introducing plant-based menus and reducing the use of beef. And last but not least, virtual and hybrid events. This definitely contributes to sustainability as um, these events are not limited by geographical, location, or physical capacity, um, thereby really helping to reduce carbon footprint. That was a very, very quick whistle stop tour. It's a, it's a huge subject, um, and we're all evolving and learning together. So Priya, last, last slide. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, um, please, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thanks to Natasha. That's extremely insightful and great to see some of the steps that you guys you guys are taking. Um, thank you. Pleasure. Are we, at least we're hearing from Liz now. Yes, if there's no questions, then yeah, that'd be great. Here we go. Thank you, Priya. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, thank you so much for having us on today. It's, it's really exciting to be able to uh, share some of our um, information with you and let you know what we've been up to and what we can offer. Um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, Historic Royal Palaces is actually an independent charity um, and we look after six royal palaces, unsurprisingly, um, five of which are London Southeast based, um, which are the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Palace, Banqueting House, which is in Whitehall, and then Kew Palace inside Kew Gardens, and also Hillsborough Castle over in Northern Ireland. Um, so over the past few months, over the past year really, virtual and hybrid events for us have really been emerging um, as a really strong new trend for us. Um, unlike Natasha, this is not something that we've ever really done before. We've not ever had anyone ask us to do this before because people have always wanted to come on site to experience the palaces um, themselves and, and be on site to, to get into the rooms etc and see it. So it's a really new trend for us and something that has been a really steep learning curve for us to work out how we can do this um, and working with our, with our approved suppliers as I said before. Um, and what we have found is um, because of the iconic nature of the venues that we um, are lucky enough to work in, um, they are they are very much an appealing option to, to clients when they're looking for someone to, uh, looking for somewhere to have a to host a virtual or hybrid event as the kind of backdrop to their event. So um, what we have been seeing the majority of the virtual events that we have already hosted and inquiries that have got coming through. Um, very much driven by the client's desire for an iconic backdrop, as I said, in front of which their C-suite execs can, can speak um, to sort of get away from that boring Zoom background that we're all kind of a bit Zoom fatigued with now. So it's kind of give a bit, bit of zhuzh, a bit of a wow factor to their events. Um, and they are coming to us to ask to have our, our venues as their backdrop, which is fantastic. So what I'm going to do today is um, just take you briefly through a bit of information about what we've been seeing coming through um, and what kind of client inquiries we've had and also give you um, run you through a current event proposal that we're working on just to kind of give you a flavour um, for uh, the different options that we are able to um, offer and the different event solutions that we're speaking to them about and what um, the functionalities, etc, of the spaces that we have. Um, so could I have the next slide, please, Priya? Fabulous, thank you. So here are some images um, of um, events that we've obviously done in the different venues. Um, but just to give you a bit of context, as I said, 
over the last few months in particular, um, we've been responding to this evolving landscape of events, um, not only, of course, to the changing requirements and desires of the clients, but also to this continuing different COVID guidelines that are coming through. We're having to continually respond and make sure that we are um, adhering to those guidelines and making sure that everybody is safe and having a safe and enjoyable event. Um, so we've done our best to remain agile. Um, we continue to develop our event solutions um, as all the new stuff is coming out. Um, and so we're continually evolving as the new stuff comes in. And, and Lisa has been uh, so helpful with that because everything is changing so quickly. Those sort of almost daily updates are, have been really helpful for us. So thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, so um, the great thing about the venues that we have, where we have found that we've really been able to benefit is that we um, have been able to benefit from various um, experiences that we have been able to offer um, and which we have been able to develop um, in response to this. So for example, we've created a number of new outdoor experiences because um, clients obviously feel a bit more safe being outside rather than inside the venues. So, so a number of our venues have wonderful outdoor spaces and we've been able to create new outdoor packages, outdoor experiences that take advantage of that. And also, as um, Lisa touched on before, specific tours of venues um, and also specific things like curator talks. So a real kind of behind the scenes look at um, content that not anybody normally gets to look at. So really having a look at what is unique, what is bespoke that we can create um, to offer some an event solution that is really exciting and really and, and new um, and, and exclusive. Um, so clients are, as I said, really looking for a wow factor for their virtual and hybrid events specifically to help ensure that those people who are online who aren't in the venues are still engaged and still enjoying their time and still able to have some value and feeling like they are being connected to the event to the venue and to what's going on on site the other thing um, that is uh, obviously really critical is uh, the quality of the content and also the quality of the delivery of that content. Um, you know, if we think about the fact that we've all been sitting at home for months watching Netflix on our HD televisions, and we all think that whenever we look at a screen now, it all has to be absolutely perfect. So um, we've really been working with our event suppliers to ensure that the quality of the, of the product that we are providing is high value um, and also that we can deliver it in a way that means that it's not kind of constantly juddering and it is you know as HD as possible <laughs> as we can do in our venues. And um, from, from speaking to international clients, obviously in particular, we're finding that they're really keen to have um, experiences that give the virtual delegates that flavor of the city or the venue that they've chosen to host the event in. So we've taken that in, um, opportunity to really draw on the richness of the stories that we have in our venues um, and the range of experience that we can offer um, in order to do two different things. One is we built a suite of virtual content options um, specifically um, based on stories from the different venues. And secondly, also um, to work with clients to curate bespoke content that can be tailored to them for their, ev for their event. So um, there's, a, there's two different options that we can give them. And this is really where we see incentive business um, moving forward, to be honest. I think this is going to be something that stays with us. Virtual events are certainly going to be with us, I think, for a little while to come. Um, and just to very quickly touch on, we have actually also hosted a number of virtual sales activities and fam trips, um, which involve a mix of pre-recorded content and live interviews. So for example, we've done live interviews with the Yeoman Warders at the Tower of London. Um, and we really think that is something that's gonna be um, with us for a while. And it really helps us to sort of connect with audiences, potential prospects to obviously help us try and um, drive some revenue through to the palaces. Um, next slide, please, Priya. Okay, so just to um, take you through an existing event proposal and give you a little bit of an idea of the sort of things that we are speaking to them about and so therefore what kind of things we can do um, for a hybrid event in particular. So the event brief um, is to host a recognition reception for employees based in the UK and Europe. Um, the event has to offer an in-person event experience that is obviously wonderful for those people who are coming into the palaces as well as offering an engaging virtual experience for those off-site attendees who are going to be watching from the uh, security of their sofas at home. Um, and the live event itself will hold 30 events 
at 30 events, 30 guests, sorry. Um, and there'll be a speech from the CEO, which is to be obviously streamed live to those who are attending from their sofas at the same time. So that's the brief. Um, Priya, could I get the next slide, please? So whoo, Kensington Palace. So we are talking to them um, about utilizing Kensington Palace where we have um, uh, done uh, virtual events from previously and we know works very well. Um, the on-site elements of the event very much follows the, the, the standard format for events. Guests will enjoy the um, live element in the King State Apartments. There'll be roaming entertainment, which will help guide them through into the State Apartments. Um, and the on-site experience will also include a tour of the palace and access to one of the exhibitions that has, is also open on site within the palace at the time. There will then follow a drinks reception set up in the State Apartments from where the CEO will then make their speech. So if I could get the next slide, please, Priya, because this is the kind of key bit really, is the hybrid event set up. So what is it that we are going to be putting in place to try and ensure the engagement and enjoyment for those who are sitting at home? So the images here that you can see are from previous virtual events that we do, give an idea of what we can offer. And, and as I said previously, we work with um, approved suppliers. So we don't have in-house tech. We have third party suppliers who come in and we work very closely. They know our venues very well um, and they know what can and can't be achieved in our spaces and they're, they're excellent at, at this type of thing. And so these are the ideas. The photo on the left-hand side you can see is essentially a studio that has been set up um, in the King's Gallery, which is the room adjacent to where we are proposing that the live event will be taking place. And from this studio, we will be streaming out um, some curated live content, but also some pre-recorded content as well that, um, that we are working on with the client um, in order to stream that out to people at home. So the content is essentially going to be curated to mirror the live event experience, but also in some ways to enhance it. Um, because we kind of feel like okay, if you're in the venue, you're already getting the, the wow factor of being in Kensington Palace. So we want to try and add in additional things that are exclusive for those who are at home that you wouldn't necessarily get to experience if you were in the venue. So uh, following on from Lauren's question earlier on, this is exactly what we're focusing on. So um, we are we are going to we are proposing that there will be a live presenter that will be in that studio um, who obviously will introduce the event and will lead the event and um, lead all the content that's going out onto um, streaming out. There will then be a pre-recorded tour experience of the palace. So when the on-site guests are doing their tour of the palace, we will be able to do a pre-recorded tour experience for those who are also at home. Then the sort of additional fun bit that people in the palace don't get to do is some form of behind the scenes talk with um, one of our curators from Kensington Palace. Um, this can take a number of different forms, of course, and we can theme that to whatever the client is interested in. And we've had some who want to specifically understand about Royal Collection paintings. We've got others that want to see a um, dress collection. So we can, um, the curators are able to bring them items that are normally in storage that are never normally seen by the public. And we can curate some kind of book um, around that specifically for the, um, the uh, online element. And then finally, um, there will obviously be the CEO speech that happens in the room adjacent that will then be streamed live as well. So essentially, um, that the different elements that we are uh, going to be off offering them is a, is a mix, of, come from a number of different spaces. So there's the on-site studio, there's the reception room, and there's also the opportunity to have this green screen set up. Um, so as Lisa touched on before, um, our production suppliers are able to create a complete virtual venue off-site as well. And this is normally something that we offer if the event on-site itself is, is going to be bigger or longer and we need to kind of put more um, en en entertainment in for those who are at home. So the green screen setup um, essentially creates a virtual venue that has elements of Kensington Palace, so it looks like Kensington Palace, but of course also can be branded to have branding for the client so that they feel like um, they are connected to it. 
And essentially, we can have any type of entertainment going on there at all. So we can have performers, we can do cocktail making classes, because we can get our suppliers to provide F&B to those at home to link in with what's going on on site, what's going on in this um, green screen studio setup. So essentially, everything that goes part of the hybrid event is an, it's a mix of pre-recorded content, live content, potential green screen um, footage, and it's all edited together seamlessly, of course, hopefully, um, to ensure that it's a good quality um, and exciting um, content for those who are sitting at home. And the key thing, of, the, of course, for this is that the platform quality um, does need to be quite advanced to ensure that it's worth watching when, when they are, are at home. But I'll come on to that in a second. Um, so can I get the next slide, please, Priya? Um, so yeah, just just uh, to touch on the different virtual enhancements to kind of just clarify um, the different um, elements that we can offer. So as I said before, we can produce bespoke content as part of a hybrid event which offers tailored content to your audience. So um, we, you can come to us with anything we can bring out all different types of suggestions. We've got a number of different stories, a number of artifacts, all kinds of exciting things that we can offer. And we can create bespoke content that can be tailored. Now that bespoke content can either be pre-recorded, so you can come on site before and pre-record whatever you'd like to do, or we can deliver it as a live um, experience on the night itself um, as from that studio, as I showed you before. The other thing that we can do is that clients can also choose to stream content from a catalogue of pre-recorded tours and talks that we have now created. So basically we have begun to develop a suite of venue specific exclusive content that we can offer to clients to utilise as per part of their virtual events. So this includes things like rooftop tours, um, uh, a tour with a, a talk with an archivist who sort of goes through amazing documents from the Tower of London. Um, we've got a behind the scenes talk with the Yeoman Warders who takes them into their on-site pub and pulls some pint with some beef eaters. Um, so there's all kinds of different um, content that we have, we are starting to develop based on what we see coming through as the most um, the experiences that people are asking for the most so what uh, what are the stories that people want to hear about from our venues and we are pre-packaging this as a sort of pre-packaged option that clients can just come in and buy that and plug that in as part of their virtual um, element and as I said before through our production supplier we can either offer the platform to over which you can stream this um, or um, we are, we are, our proof suppliers can obviously work with your own platform. So if a client has their own platform, we of course can just work with that. It's absolutely not a problem. Um, and it's, as I said before, just need to make sure that, that that quality is really good. And we've got a number of different ones that we have used previously for events which work really well. Um, and we have good capabilities at the venues, obviously, to make sure that the, um, that the, the uh, internet connection is stable enough to do it. Um, and then Finally, just another key thing to think about when you are thinking about potentially doing virtual events is the functionality of the venue. Um, because actually what you'll find is, is that you need quite a lot of space to do virtual events. Um, so you've got, if you're doing you know, um, one element where you've got the live stuff going on on site, you will need a completely separate room that still is able to kind of offer a similar experience to the on-site event, um, but is big enough to put all the kit, kit in. There's quite a lot of technical kit that comes with these things. Um, so it's just worth um, thinking about um, what functionality does the venue have? What multiple spaces do they have that you can use that will still be that same experience? And also, I said, as I said before, the internet connection and ensuring that the sort of the tech support is there in order to, um, support the event for you and that's all from me that was just a quick whiz thank, through thank, there we are thank you very it. thank you very much indeed Liz. i think um what's really interesting listening to all of this is how you guys at uvl have collaborated in your own learning and development and experience so that you've, you know the that knowledge that you all share with one another will make your individual offerings so much stronger um and I think there where you were both talking about of you know how you can use the venues, this key, you know, what, what you as venues or your your guest speakers can bring to an event will far exceed holding it at I won't name a hotel, but a very nice hotel on Park Lane or something. Um, 
<clears throat> so yeah, I think I think it's great. I think that's the sort of thing that people will want to you know to support them in coming, bringing events back to life. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it there because we have we have run over slightly, but I, it has been really really interesting.